Welcome to the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 081. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Welcome back to the Veterinary Project Podcast. You are joined by smiling Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Mikey, what's shaking? Well, good to be back. I missed that missed the recording there with Isaiah, so left you hanging, but you, you took it like a champ, so happy to be back with you. I owned it. We disagreed. It was a great conversation further and upwards in the crypto world. But it's not what we're talking about today, though. We're switching gears again. What are we doing today? Well, this was a great conversation. Doug Jack, you know, yeah. well-known lawyer in the veterinary space. As soon as I saw you were, you were lining him up as a guest, I was like, oh, this is going to be a great conversation. A long time coming. And I think this is one, right? We see Doug at conferences. He's in the CVJ. Uh, he is a... a, a gives all legal perspective for multiple different corporates, uh, his knowledge base. I think, what did he say? More than 35 years in practice now with a lot of them specifically focused on veterinary medicine. He is in my view, and I am biased, but to the positive, the man when it comes to legal in Canada for veterinary medicine. So great to have him on the podcast. And he gets into some, uh, interesting areas that we all need to be cognizant of. Hey, eh? Yeah, it was a great conversation. I mean, the whole ranging of it, the risk management all the way right to the end, you know, a little sort of constructive criticism, maybe for veterinary professionals, all of it was good. Let's, let's give a couple of those away because I want to ensure that people are listening to the full hour today. So when we're talking about risk management, that is not something that normally comes in to the purview of a regular veterinary owner. You don't say, hey, I'm going to focus on risk management today. Doug says you need to. In this change in complexity of the consumer base at the center, he says, you need to look at it. And we talked about what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Then we're looking at the overheated veterinary market in terms of supply and demand and purchasing of veterinary clinics, a hot topic. Great to hear from Doug and the real on what's going down when you're talking about corporate buyouts, practices, valuations, again, rumors versus reality are sometimes two different things. And we talk about it. Lastly, what about taking a colleague to lunch? How we are hard on ourselves, how we are even harder on our own colleagues. And why is that? And I think Doug provides some great introspection or ability to provide some introspection on how we should all be looking at ourselves when we're talking about our colleagues. Just gave away the podcast. You need to listen to the next hour. It's important. Yeah, it was a good one. That's the whatever, TLDR. Cole's note versions for everyone. What is TLDR? What? Too long, didn't read. You've never heard that before? No. Oh, man. <laughs> if there's a long post, TLDR, bang, here's the punchline. So I was just TLDDRDDC. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Let's move on. Before we get going, we have to first start. Mike, what is our quick tip? All righty. Quick tip. I, I like sports, so I'll put it in a sports analogy. It's simply review the game tape. Um, and, and I'm choosing this one in reference to how Doug ends this podcast. I really recommend everyone stays through to the end because he kind of reviews the game tape for veterinarians. You need to be open to looking at your performance and open to constructive criticism. And sometimes it is hard. Sometimes it's hard to hear. Sometimes it's hard to see you know, taking it medically, you know, if you mess up on a surgery, diving in, well, why did it go wrong? Um, I'm not going to give away where, where Doug takes this. You got to listen to the end, but it is very powerful. So review the game tape. Great quick tip can be taken in so many places in life. Thank you, Dr. Bug. Doug Jack, he's a partner in Canada's largest law firm, 
Borden, Ladner, Gervais, the only national law firm with a team of lawyers under Doug's leadership dedicated to the law as it relates to the practice of veterinary medicine. He's an associate member of the Ontario Veterinary Medical Association and the Veterinary Hospitals Managers Association, as well as a charter and founding member of the American Veterinary Medical Law Association, the only Canadian to have served as its president. Doug is a sought after speaker on veterinary legal matters at veterinary conferences worldwide, as well as the author of two books and numerous articles on the legal aspects of veterinary practice management. He presents annual lectures on veterinary jurisprudence at Atlantic Veterinary College, Ontario Veterinary College, the Western College of Veterinary Medicine, and the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Calgary. He and his wife, Debbie, live near Owen Sound, Ontario with their aging Havanese dog. In his downtime, Doug enjoys hiking, having successfully reached the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro, and is an avid baseball fan, having completed a tour of every major league ballpark. This is a wide-ranging, important conversation. Please enjoy our time with Doug Jack. Doug, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. This is going to be a very interesting <laughs> discussion. Jonathan, thank you for the kind invitation. I'm uh, happy to join you. You were one of the first guests when we brainstormed originally almost two years ago of guests that we'd like to have on the podcast. Your name. And yet it took you two years to get the invitation to me. I believe there was some back and forth over the last two years to make this happen. But (laughs) are we starting to argue the first minute already? I like it. I'm a a lawyer. (laughs) (laughs) And yes, you are. And you provided counsel for me uh, in multiple methods and, and over the last few years. So really respect uh, your viewpoint, and uh, we're in an interesting place within veterinary medicine. And set up for this podcast, we discussed some themes that we could touch on. And the first is, I think, as a broad overview, what are you seeing in the veterinary space, Doug? Considering that and your perspective, are there places that veterinarians that are listening to this should be aware of as we've moved from a vet centric industry now into a more consumer centric industry? Yeah, I think so, Jonathan. I think it, it's very prudent for all practice owners and uh, associates, everybody in the, on the veterinary team to be aware of this consumer-centric model that we seem to uh, be adopting. Uh, certainly, we see it in the nature of claims that are being, being mm-hmm. raised against veterinarians. And I think veteran, the veterinary profession generally is at a stage where it really needs to introduce risk management as one of the fundamental management aspects of successful companion animal practice. It also relates to large animal practice as well, because let's face it, we all know that there are lots of large animal owners who treat their large animals as large, small animals. Uh, and, and, and so, where you know, the, the, this consumer-centric model, I think, has arisen in the context of the human-animal bond. And I, for one, believe that the human-animal bond exists. I don't think we need another scientific paper on whether or not it uh, is present. It's there. And with the emergence of the human-animal bond comes you know, animal owners' expectations about the professional services that are being yes. delivered to them. And those expectations are high. I think that uh, all of us would agree that we're living in a fairly cranky society. And when something goes wrong, uh, people are pointing fingers. And I think up until about the last decade or so, you know, I've been practicing for 37 years, and uh, it's only been in about the last decade where veterinarians have be- become the foci of claims for malpractice. And I think that it is a direct result of the human-animal bond. People place more value on their animals, and as a result, you would think that the status of veterinarians would go up as well, and I think it has. But so do the expectations of clients. And so uh, risk management is uh, needs to become part of the the lexicon for effective and successful hospital uh, management. What I see recurring and, you know, if there's 
two hot tips that I can give on this. You know, we could have an academic discussion about jurisprudence and how we got to where we are. I don't think that's of particular interest to your listeners. I think what your listeners want are a couple of takeaways that they can implement tomorrow in their clinics so that they can implement effective risk management strategies. And a couple of them, and, and you've heard them before, and I've spoken yep. at conferences all over the world on these two topics for the last 25 years. And it needs to be repeated because there's two simple things that can be done that in one aspect of my practice, that is complaints and discipline defense, um, they're easily implemented, but they are repeatedly missed. And they just get you in trouble. So let's have a discussion about informed, disc about informed consent to treatment. Uh, all of your listeners know they need to get it. They think they get it but I don't think they've really drilled down on what it actually is. So let's spend a minute and make sure that your listeners leave this podcast today with the notion and a better understanding of what the legal requirements for informed consent to treatment are. First, it all goes to our explanation of the risk. What's the risk associated with any particular medical or surgical treatment that this animal is going to be subjected to? And it's up to the practitioner, the one with carriage of the file, to describe to the owner the material risks and the probable risks, material and probable, okay. and the possible risks if those risks are catastrophic. So let's, let's drill down a bit on, on those notions. Perfect. First of all, you need to get consent and it needs to be informed, and it needs to be from the owner. Best way to find out who the owner of an animal is, is to look that person in the eye and say, are you the owner of this animal? <laughs> because if they say yes, then you've got the owner. But they may say no. They may say, well, no, it's my sister's dog, or it's my neighbor's cat and they're away on holidays. You need to get the consent of the owner. And you don't need to have too much of an imagination to see how that can manifest itself in a problem when you don't have the actual owner. And this happens in practice every day. Absolutely, it does. I, 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 I could write memoirs on errors made in defining who the owner of an animal is. As, I, as I've said, that consent needs to be informed. So you need to advise of the probable risks and the material risks. The, mater the material risks are going to be defined by an understanding on a subjective basis of the relationship that the veterinarian has with this particular animal owner. You know, is this a breeder client? If so, well, then the risk of, infer of infertility is yeah. material. It needs to be probable risk. And that's an objective assessment. That's yep. based on the skill, knowledge, expertise, review of the literature, all of those things that form the opinion of the veterinarian as to what constitutes a probable risk. Now, unfortunately, the Supreme Court of Canada uh, hasn't given us a lot of direction on what probable means. Mm -hmm. uh, the Supreme Court in uh, uh, human medicine uh, negligence lawsuit uh, indicated that probable was anything more than the mere possible. And so that's not particularly helpful, but courts and licensing bodies use those tenants on a regular basis in reviewing these types of cases. So based on the knowledge, skill, experience, review of the literature, what is probable? The last thing is that you need to define the possible risk mm -hmm. if that risk is catastrophic. And Jonathan, Mike, I think that if there was a single issue that uh, I would point to as a recurring and frequent a uh, problem within the profession in terms of managing informed consent to treatment, it's that one. Okay. Because all of us know, all of us know that when there's a general anesthetic in use, there's a risk of death, right? 
We all know that. When I, when I lecture at veterinary colleges throughout this country and I ask the students, you know, hands up everybody who agrees with me that every time you use a general anesthetic, there's a risk of death. Every hand goes up. So you know that. Why is it then that there are legions of cases where that risk of death, even though mere possibility was not explained? Because let me tell you, the cases of anesthetic deaths that go before the small claims courts and the discipline committees of provincial authorities are legion. So being tactful on that one to, ju to jump in for a second here is informed consent to the probable or possible catastrophic ends able to be taken up by informed consent in writing, by a check mark, by a signature, yeah. by a discussion by a registered veterinary technologist or only by a verbal discussion by a doctor then put in a medical record. So we're on a spectrum. Yep. And, and you know, at the one end of this spectrum, you know, the, the textbook perfect gold standard is a licensed veterinarian sitting down with a client and explaining the probable, the material, the possible if catastrophic, documenting that in the medical record, initialing it. Now we've got informed consent to treatment. However, <laughs> gentlemen, if I'm anything, I'm not naive. <laughs> and what I know is that the gold standard rarely happens in a busy clinical setting. And so what it becomes is management of the risk. You know, how much risk is any particular uh, practitioner prepared within the requirements of the law to fall below that standard? You know, could we have a technician mm -hmm. give this information? Answer, yes. And does it happen? It happens regularly. Is that the best standard? No, it's not the best standard because in cross-examination, when, when, when that technician is asked to offer an opinion about whether or not a, uh, something was uh, probable or not, it requires that technician, unlicensed, to offer a medical opinion that he or she is not able to provide. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so it, 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 you want to aspire to the gold standard within the framework of understanding the, 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 the nature of, vet, of veterinary practice and how fast it moves and how fast you need to, to, to pivot. Understanding that you're gonna to have to accept some of the risk. Um, That's perfect. And, 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 and ultimately, what your, your question really went to, okay, we know what informed consent is. How do we evidence it? You know, how do we provide evidence of it? And obviously the best way is to have it in writing. So have a consent form, have it, have, you know, people go through it and, and be thoughtful about the process. I think that's okay. probably the takeaway. The, the takeaway is that the current problem is that this aspect of veterinary practice, this risk management aspect is treated in far too cavalier a way. Yeah. And, and, and you just need to slow it down and, and, and move in and be thoughtful with the client so that he or she actually does understand what is going to happen. And if you do that, and if you understand informed consent a, a, a bit better, then all of these cases about, they never told me that, you know, the he said, she said, get, get wiped away. So written informed consent, probable material possible if catastrophic from the owner. If you do that, I think that you're in good shape. Thank you for tip number one. Mike, I can see yeah, you jumping there. I want to jump in, Doug. What other big buckets? So you mentioned like anesthetic death. That's a big bucket that happens frequently. One that jumped out to me, maybe like injection site sarcomas. What do you see across your desk like frequently that are big things that happen? I think a lot of it is uh, not following the you know, non-compliance issue. So if I was going to put it in a big bucket, as you've asked, Mike, it would be big bucket non-compliance. Here are the discharge instructions. If you see any of these things happening, let us know. Is it enough to have those discharge instructions sent home? 
and then be provided to read them as you see at a human pharmacy? Or do we have to go through them all? Because well, in the case of some of our drugs now, we're going through each and every one of them, but uh, there's well, a time well, constraint. Well, once again, it's, it, you know, it's, uh, it's how much risk do you want to assume and, and what's the standard? You know, the standard would be, yes, you should go through each one of those, those uh, itemized list on the discharge instructions and recognize as you have, Jonathan, quite rightfully, but that, that you know, sometimes you don't have enough time. Well, I, I guess I, I, I would debate you on that a little bit yeah. on the basis of how much time is that actually taking? I, I'm thinking that if we put a stopwatch on that, that's probably a minute and a half to go through that. As opposed to, my friend, days and hours of pre pre preparing for examinations for discovery, for engaging witnesses to defend yourself against this particular thing. So, you know, uh, you know I'm only being a little facetious no, here. No. But, you know, time management is another important management aspect of successful veterinary practice, along with risk management, along with financial management, management, along with inventory management, along with personnel, all of those things go into the hopper. Time management, I think, is closely connected to risk management because I think people are too motivated by saving time when, in fact, if you accept the fact, as I believe it to be, that we live in a cranky society, then I think risk management trumps time management. Perfect. I cut Mike off and you off from other pieces that you see coming across the desk. Let's nail on those real quickly that you see coming across from this perspective. Uh, so so non-compliance is a big one. Uh, I, I think uh, expectations of recovery I think are, you know, you know, managing the, the client, you know, after some complicated uh, orthopedic surgery, uh, you know, the dog's not running down the street the day after uh, and they don't understand it. And, and, and that creates uh, issues. Uh, and, and, and I think once again, high level, I know Mike, you wanted me to sort of get into some specific ones, but I, I, I think the more beneficial aspect of this and because the, the, the specific ones are hit and miss. The, the, the beneficial one, I think, for your listeners is communication. You know, just, you know, answer the questions, offer up, take the time, be professional. That's what that's what the client expectation is now, because they don't they no longer view this as a fifty dollar pound tag. They view this as a family member. And there's case law emerging throughout this country that is accepting the notion of the human animal bond. Used to be animals are property. There's 600 years of English common law that stands for the proposition that animals are property. So that damages in a malpractice case would be limited to the value of the animal. That's the, 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 the floodgates have opened on that. Uh, and there's lower court decisions admittedly in most provinces now that accept that there can be damages awarded for the emotional distress suffered by an owner as a result of the loss of the animal. So risk management, I think it's risk important. Management. Great one. And one in operations that definitely needs to be focused on. Number two, hot tip. Medical records. <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody says that the law is black and white. Well, it's not. I can tell you with every assurance that there's lots of shades of gray. And as a result, uh, it is critical that practitioners spend the time necessary to properly record in a factual way everything that happened with this particular patient. There is a rule of evidence law called the adverse inference rule which is generally uh, uh, interpreted as if it ain't written down, it didn't happen. There is nothing more frustrating for somebody like me who defends veterinarians when I know that he or she is competent, did everything that was appropriate and met the standard of care, but it's not written down. And so this adverse inference rule, if it, didn't, if it ain't written down, it didn't happen is a difficult challenge. So it just, it's just better to write it down. It sets out 
what, what, what happened, what the drug dosage was, what the commentary from the uh, owner was, what the history of the animal was, uh, who performed that particular service. Uh, the medical records are just key. The other rule of evidence is that business records are admissible in evidence and they do not offend the hearsay rule so long as those records are contemporaneous. So you can't wait two weeks and go back and, and start writing your medical records. They've got to be contemporaneous in order for them to be uh, uh, admissible. Uh, and so uh, hot tip number two, <laughs> pay attention to your medical records. You know, we started this with, you know, you know what's been happening in the, in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you know, electronic medical records have happened in the marketplace in the last couple of decades. And so there, there's not as many problems involved with medical records, uh, you know, back in the days when they were larger size recipe cards that people wrote in, in handwriting on. Uh, but they still need to be done and they need to be done contemporaneously. And so I'd encourage all of your listeners to uh, make sure they have informed consent to treatment and spend some thoughtful time on medical records. Medical records are, are, are funny things. If they're done right, they will save you. If they're done wrong, they will destroy you. So I'm for saving and uh, I think they should be done right. I, I feel like all of our veterinary listeners right now are, are having mild panic attacks. <laughs> I'm thinking of all of my records and being like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I, I, think we have our quote, I think we have our quote for the week as well too, right there. I, uh, I, uh, I see that uh, regularly and it, and it, and it's, you know, it's disappointing uh, because you probably did do the right thing. The problem is you can't prove it. <laughs> and so from that standpoint, Doug, switching gears a little bit, because we could go an hour on medical records standpoint, and there's been a, um, a technology advancement to software um, that is serverless and there is templates, etc. You mentioned this, you know, briefly, but I do want to ask directly, do you see less cases coming forward as a result of medical records not being up to snuff? Uh, no, I would not say that. Uh, but, you know, uh, let's put it in perspective. I only see the bad ones, right? Yep. Uh, uh, I, I see, I don't think that, that, that the technology has necessarily given rise to less complaints okay. because the complaint really isn't focused on this veterinarian produced bad medical records. So it, it is an add-on to the real issue of did this veterinarian, did he or she meet the standard of care? And then we use that medical record evidence in a determination of whether or not the standard was met. Okay. But what I can say is that, listen, uh, going back to the human animal bond and our cranky society, as I've uh, hypothesized, uh, uh, the regulatory bodies, the ABVMA, the CVO, the CVBC, uh, they're all showing increases in complaints against veterinarians. In Ontario, it skyrocketed through the pandemic. Uh, and so, you know, with more complaints, there's going to be more investigation. There's going to be more looking at medical records to support the conduct of the veterinarian in any particular case. Nice. Can I jump in here? I know we want to move on, but I have sort of a, a follow up on this. Where does that risk fall, Doug? So there's a complaint of some sort issued and it's a veterinarian that saw the case Will it fall on that veterinarian or what like risk does the practice have, you know, like the business itself? The, uh, the complaints process, Mike, is individual to the licensed member of the particular provincial body. Uh, and so the claim would be against the licensee, not the uh, clinic itself. Uh, that's a little bit different than in uh, litigation and small claims court where plaintiff's counsel is merely going to throw the net over as many people as possible, uh, including the corporate entity that owns the practice, the individual veterinarians that participated in the thing. Who knows? They may even add their technician to the claim. 
uh, they'll, they'll, you know, and the drugs were no good. So let's get the pharma company involved. You know, everybody's going to be involved. But the, 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 the key one and the one that I deal mostly with is at the at the complaints and discipline level of the regulatory body. And that is individual to the practitioner. Perfect. I'd love to switch gears here a little bit in our remaining minutes. I am part of a corporate group. There are more and more corporate groups in Canada. There is a plethora down in the States, dozens and dozens. Veterinary succession. We are in the middle and or on the tail end, depending on what you want to look at it. It's been going for a while now, an overheated marketplace. Doug, tell me about the perspective from your vantage as the one that is writing a lot of these deals up. Jonathan, I've never seen anything like it. And I would never have anticipated seeing anything like it. And I don't think anybody did. Yeah. You know, I, I've been around a long time <laughs> and uh, I've seen the movement towards corporate ownership and the consolidators. Uh, and we all remember, you know, back in those days, uh, individual licensed uh, practice owners uh, were very wary of it. They were cautious about the corporates. Uh, these people were only there to make money. They didn't care about the standards of care. And all of that was proven to be absolutely wrong. Uh, that every study that's been done since then uh, demonstrate that the corporate practices, while profitable, uh, are meet, the, meet or exceed the standards of care. Uh, because let's face it, they've got the money to invest in their people and continue education and have the best equipment and access to all of this. And so, you know, uh, you know, I, I think corporate practice is here to stay. Uh, you know, veterinary practice prior to the corporate consolidators was very fragmented, and the marketplace responded by saying, "Wait a minute, we can probably consolidate, make this more efficient, make it more profitable." and maintain consumer confidence in the services that are being delivered. But what we've seen in the last 18 months or two years is uh, off the charts. Uh, and it goes to essentially the valuation. You know, conventional uh, 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 veterinary practice valuation models, uh, the net tangible asset uh, valuation, uh, gave rise to, you know, normal, modest, mo mo modest uh, values, but, 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 but could be liquidated and, and a practice owner could live quite comfortably, comfortably on the sale proceeds. Uh, the, the valuation methodology has changed uh, dramatically now almost exclusively among the consolidators, at least yeah. a multiple of EBITDA uh, and the multiples we're seeing, uh, frankly, make no sense to me. I have completed transactions within the last year where the value has been 28 times EBITDA. The vast majority of them, and we've done, we, we've done, I have done more veterinary transaction sales uh, in the last year than I did in the aggregate five years prior. That's how overheated the market is. And I would say that on balance, if I were to reflect on these transactions, we were seeing a lot of practices in the 15 to 18 times uh, EBITDA uh, range. And that has now backed off. Now we're sort of 10, 10 to 12. And, and it's interesting because, you know, I have a good relationship with the corporate consolidators with their with their leadership. I, I don't act for them. I don't advocate for them. I act for vendors. You know, as I get older, I my clients get older and I end up so I end up acting for a lot of vendors. Uh, but what I uh, see uh, and I'm not the only one I, I, I talk to people and people that you would know within the, yep. uh, the industry. Uh, and we all agree that these valuations are completely unsustainable. They, they, they make no sense. Uh, and so I've challenged the consolidators. I, you know, I'm on good terms with them. And I've called them and I've said, these values, like how, how can this be? And uh, I, I said, let me put it to you. I, I think these are unsustainable. And you know what their answer is? You're right. 
They are. Yeah. And so the next question is, well, then why do you pay them? Yeah. And the answer is because we have to. And it's just supply and demand and competition and capitalism in its apparently perfect form, but, and great for vendors, <laughs> but really you know, best for buyers and or individual veterinarians that may be trying to get into the market. And, and you again, that's the a word, generalization. You, 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 you took the words right out of my mouth, Jonathan. You know, there's some, there, 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 there's some fallout from this. And all those young associates who joined that clinic, in an effort to establish themselves, gain some knowledge, gain some confidence with a view to becoming an equity participant in this thing, gets washed away. Yeah. Because the, 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 the prices are unsustainable. They, they're, they're just uh, overheated as, as you've mentioned. So, uh, so that's what I see. And that's what I see happening in the, in the near future. Uh, there's no shortage of transactions coming across my desk. It's still happening, uh, but it's gonna change. I don't know when it's gonna change. If you're a vendor and you get a proposal, you should move on it because uh, I don't think that the, I don't think it's gonna last forever. Appreciate that perspective, Doug, and one that, like you said, you see it through all the different corporate groups, and we've had multiple discussions on this. It's the, it's always the question of what's the good, the bad, and sometimes the good, the bad has no part in this discussion. It's what's needed yeah. from a supply demand curve. That's what it is. So you mentioned that, and then also, you know, what's the horizon look like? 24, 48, 72 hours or year, excuse me, months out. Yeah. When you do still need to make a return on these investments. Yeah. I don't know how it can be done. Appreciate that. Mike, anything to add? We have one last point I no, do I, want to touch on briefly here. Nothing valuable. Like you guys are more in the know there. I just, there's so, so much money floating around and you know, the veterinary space is hot. And whenever yeah. we talk, I'm blown away by the multiples. Yeah. yeah. And it's also a change, you know, in, in chatting with, you know, Dr. Greg Andrews, who's our CEO with Mosaic. I think the perspective that you provided at the start, which is really important is the way that the values of these practices are also been identified over the last five years is changed immensely as well. And that's important. And we're seeing that with some of our vendors, you know, I work in a mixed animal world now where there's an education that also has to happen to how these processes occur. Can you touch on that, Doug, because you work for a lot of vendors. How is, how, how does that education process progress? In, in, in my experience, Jonathan, it, it progresses in the heat of the moment. You know, the, the, the learning curve is short and steep uh, because let's face it, vendors have exclusively practiced veterinary medicine for the yeah. last 25 or 30 years. And now they're thrust into a relatively complicated commercial transaction. Uh, and so moving them through the process is one of the things that we do right out of the gate. You know, we have a lengthy conversation about, you know, what the phases of the transaction are, how long generally they should expect to be in each one of these phases, what the expectations are in terms of due diligence, disclosure. Uh, you know, managing the client is an important role for us to play in these transactions so that they have, uh, you know, understandable expectations. They're not simple. You know, a share transaction in the veterinary uh, uh, world is complicated. There's a lot of disclosure. There's a lot of review of the disclosure documents. Uh, because if you're paying those types of prices, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're, you're buying that which you thought you were buying and nothing more. Uh, so it's an ongoing process. And, uh, and uh, you know, from start to finish, most transactions are over and done within about 90 days. Uh, some are sooner, some are later. Uh, but I would think uh, uh, most commonly from the time that a letter of intent is signed through to the actual completion of the transaction, you're, you're probably within that time frame, and the education moves on that, that entire time. And if there is any place that you would direct anyone, and I'm putting you on the spot here, but there is a lot of conversation. I, I had three of them last week in terms of vendors that are looking at processes, et cetera, in their space. Where would you direct them to? Because there is such a gamut of conversation, some right, some wrong out there yeah. currently. You know, I've always observed that there was no central place for mm -hmm. veterinarians to sort of meet 
uh, and 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 for want of a better term, broker deals. Uh, you know, I think uh, the vast majority of the transactions I'm involved in arise from, at least in a corporate consolidator context, uh, arise from the consolidators going out and making cold calls themselves on practice that they think would meet their metrics of uh, interest. Uh, for some of the smaller practices where they don't meet those metrics, uh, I receive a lot of calls. I think uh, lawyers across the country, accountants across the country are regularly uh, presented with clients who either want to buy or sell. And have you heard anything? Do you know anybody who might? Those types of conversations uh, that the various uh, veterinary groups, the OVMA, for, for instance, uh, some of the other provincial bodies, you know, have sort of classified sections of their newsletters online that, that people can advertise. Uh, we've seen in the last 10 to 12 months, the emergence of uh, corporate brokers yep. who who uh, uh, will approach and for a fee, uh, introduce people to corporate consolidators. Uh, you know, I'm regularly introducing clients to people that I know within the sector that they can say, here, I'm interested in selling. Are you interested in buying? And then I just send them off to have that discussion. And if that results in a letter of, in, of intent, then we proceed on the transaction. But uh, there, there's, there's still, Jonathan, I'd have to comment that there's still a lot of fragmentation in the process of putting buyers and sellers together. I agree with you. And there's a, there's a angst that's involved in that. And the more the rumors, the flight, the, all of this discussion on the overheated marketplace, it, to me, it brings up even more stress within you know, I, I, I agree. specifically I, vendors that are looking to sell that, like you said, a practice of veterinary medicine their whole lives and are now in, immersed in multi-million dollar deals. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, lastly, because our time's coming to an end and that's a whole sure. conversation in itself, that process. Uh, I want to switch forms once and because this is in terms of the themes and this discussion around taking a colleague to lunch. Doug, what do you mean by that? What is this? I, you know, as I said, I've been doing this a long time and I've, you know, as a non-veterinarian, I think I have a level of objectivity based on my observations of veterinarians. You know, in my 37 or 38 years of practicing law, I probably know more veterinarians than you do. No. And, and, you know, there's a character set that, the, that, the, that you tend to evoke. Uh, and it's dangerous to, to speak in generalizations, uh, but that character set presents in a quite admirable way. You know, veterinarians tend to be, in my opinion, uh, loyal, trustworthy, hardworking, dedicated, passionate to what they do, honest, uh, you know, all of those, those ad adjectives that are positive. Uh, but there's a dark side to you people. <laughs> uh, and, and the two that I can enunciate because I see it regularly is number one, you are incredibly impatient. Uh, you know, and that's the nature of the being, you know, your case, your diagnosis, your responsibility, you got to move ahead, you got to go to the next case. You want, and, and you see immediate things happen. Law doesn't work that way. <laughs> law, law doesn't work instantaneously. It's a slow moving beast. Uh, and as a result, I, I, I think that a lot of veterinary clients tend to be a bit uh, impatient. Uh, the other thing is, the, the other sort of dark side I've noticed is that you are, in my view, pathologically individuals. You don't play well together. And that's part of your, your that's your, that's your professional uh, aspects. I mean, once again, you're responsible for this case. You work yeah. within your, your own uh, uh, four walls of this particular case on a regular basis. Uh, but what I mean on the, you know, take a colleague for lunch. Uh, listen, if there's anything that your listeners take from this podcast today, take that. Take a colleague for lunch. Yeah. Here's what I see. This pathological individualism, I think, manifests itself in improper and unprofessional conduct 
between veterinary colleagues. Yep. You tend to be carnivorous with each other. You'll go to the class reunions, you'll slap each other on the back, great to see you. But if that person opens a clinic two blocks from your clinic, you turn on them. And I see it so often. The, the threat of competition manifests itself in, in, in veterinarians making discourteous and belittling comments about their competitors. And it just can be avoided. You know, if I look at all of the complaints and discipline cases over the years, yep. most of them, I can point to a comment that another veterinarian has made about the conduct of my client. Yep. Several years ago, I gave a keynote lecture at the CVMA convention. And in preparation for that talk, I did my own little unscientific anecdotal uh, research and I contacted the registrars of the uh, provincial bodies and I asked them two questions. Number one, how many complaints are made against veterinarians by veterinarians? Answer, very few. Second question, how many complaints are raised against veterinarians as a result of comments made by another veterinarian? Answer, very many. And while that's not scientific, it confirmed my own observation. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not for a moment advocating a conspiracy of silence. If there's a bad actor in your neighborhood, that person needs to be outed, yep. okay? But, too often, I find veterinarians prejudging the conduct of their colleagues. How could they possibly have known what financial restraints that client was placing on that veterinarian? How do we know how many declines were received from that client when the veterinarian was offering various alternatives to care for this animal? Instead, they say to the client, I would never have done it that way. Or she didn't know what she was doing. And Setting that's up. the only thing the client remembers hearing. And so now it ends up at the discipline committee. And as I say, there should not be a conspiracy of silent, silence. But for the most part, <laughs> complaints can be dealt with and avoided by simply picking up the phone or sending an email and saying, you know, I saw your, your yeah. client, Mrs. Jones, last week, and she said this, and I was a bit concerned about it. Can we have a coffee? And let's talk about it. Then make a determination about whether or not this person made an inappropriate conduct. But, but Jonathan, Michael, I see this far too often. And, and you know, I know so many veterinarians, and I know that they're good people. And I just don't understand why there's so much antipathy between them when it comes to, 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 to competition. So, uh, uh, you know, with that, you know, take a colleague out for lunch, folks. Doug, I, I so much appreciate your objective view of that. And it is, it's 1000% correct. It's something we need to change as an industry. We need to change as each individual taking their own perspective of what they are or aren't speaking about. And like you said, picking up the phone, which can be sometimes so intimidating when you only work within those four walls and therefore don't know those individuals. COVID has not made it better, but then therefore COVID cannot be the excuse either because this is this has occurred way before COVID came into the forefront. Sure, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Mike, anything to add to that? No, I'm, I'm, thank you for sharing that, Doug, because sometimes much. difficult things to hear are very needed. So I really hope everyone listening, you know, takes that and, and does some reflection on it. Good, good. Agreed. With that, though, Doug, we are then going to move to our impact round. So our impact, impact round, round, a series okay. of short questions, which can be answered any way you would like. 
Our first <laughs> question that we ask all guests, are you a cat or a dog person? Dog. I knew you were going that way. And Mike, I think the, the, the levers are moving back to center. We used to be more cats than dogs. <laughs> True and false. I, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer since I was a kid. Uh, true. In my family, in my family, men in our family only had two choices. You're either a lawyer or a Presbyterian minister. Took the law degree standpoint. Doug, how would your friends describe what you do for a living? Uh, uh, corporate lawyer doing something weird with veterinarians with a big firm in Toronto. <laughs> Which really isn't that reflective because for the first 25 years of my practice life, I was a sole practitioner in rural Ontario. And changed exactly to the other side. Yeah. What is your favorite hobby? Hiking. And what in this world are you most grateful for? Uh, good health. I think the adage is true. Without that, you got nothing. Agreed that. Agreed. And what I would add to that is without a good lawyer, your life is a lot harder. <laughs> well, thank you for that. <laughs> I, and truthfully, if there's something that I can share with, you know, listeners that you know, on the spot here, um, there are places that you can save money in business. Having proper legal advice is not one of them. I have gone down that road multiple times. It has never worked out well. Doug, you and I have known each other for years and the, in the consent or the, the advice that you have provided for uh, has been invaluable and continues to be invaluable. It is uh, John, Jonathan, so appreciated. That, that, Jonathan, that's very kind. It's true. You've, you've gotten me through some hard stuff. We worked through some things together and I see more of that in future needed. And if there's a place in veterinary medicine that I could share with our listeners is don't be afraid to reach out and get great legal support without a doubt. And Doug, you've been that for me. Veterinary medicine. Thank you, Thank you Jonathan. Yeah. So thank you very much for coming on to our podcast today, Doug. Long time coming. Some great words of advice, sage advice um, to the present and to the potential future here within veterinary medicine. If people want to reach out to you, Doug, where do they find you? How do they get a hold of you? Uh, old method, telephone, toll free, 1-800-563-2595. Uh, email dcjack at blg.com. Excellent. Mike, any last words? Just thank you. Thanks, Doug. I mean, we've, we've talked about having you on forever. We, you can't have a veterinary podcast without having you on. You just have so much wisdom in the, in the veterinary legal world. Michael, thank you. Excellent. Uh, conversations on the Veterinary part Project podcast always finish with our guests. What message do you want to leave for the veterinary community? Uh, you are part of a dynamic and evolving profession of which you can be very proud. To tell you the truth, I'm a bit envious, but embrace the dynamism, make sure you can pivot and enjoy your practice because you work hard. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.